So thanks, Christian, for joining today. Um, I always get a lot out of these conversations. And uh, uh, yeah, um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about by simulation today because it's been a topic that uh, you and Mike and I have been talking about a lot. And mm -hmm. um, and I I can't stress its importance. Um, um, because it's such a far ranging notion. It has such an interesting history. Um, and it, it impacts a lot of, um, uh, what, uh, we want out of computing systems, um, and in general out of, out of formal systems. Yeah. Um, so, um, The idea is really um, very simple. Um, how would you know when two entities are the same? That's that's really the, the most basic question. And 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 there are lots of situations where we can uh, where we can look at this question that I think you know people who aren't steeped in the in the the art can understand. Um, one one example is you know imagine that. Um, you know, Alice goes to work very early in the morning before the crack of dawn. Um, and every day that she goes to work, she sees this character who is dressed in a um, trench coat and a fedora also going to work, or at least so she assumes. And then, um, you know, Bob coming home every night um, sees uh, a character on his way home from work, or so he assumes, dressed in overalls and a um, denim shirt and uh, farmer boots. Um, and how would, if Alice and Bob were to get together and compare notes, um, what um, methodology might they use to determine whether or not the two characters that they see are related or in fact the same? Um, so this is actually an age old question from philosophy, um, but it's a practical question, right? It's the kind of question that uh, um, um, investigative units like the, uh, the city police have to look into. Um, so what, what method would you use to determine whether or not these two characters are in fact the same character? That's Another interesting. I've never, I've never heard that question before. Oh, oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. A, um, <clears throat> Another, uh, another, another one would be, you know, I've got a beaker uh, and I've poured some chemicals in it and I've got another beaker and I've poured some other, potentially other chemicals in it. And by what methods would I um, uh, determine or ascertain whether or not the, the chemicals in the first beaker are the same as the chemicals in the second beaker? Mm -hmm. uh, and this gets really interesting mathematically when we realize that we can write down a system of differential equations. Um, so let's say one grad student writes down a system of differential equations that models the, chemi the chemicals in uh, the first speaker. And um, a different grad student writes down a different set of differential equations uh, modeling the chemicals in the second speaker. How would we know whether or not the two systems of differential equations were the same? Right, so if you were presented with two different um, sets of differential equations, um, how would you know whether or not they are the same, describe the same system of behavior? Um, <clears throat> and they, they, they could be very, very different in presentation, but ultimately describe the same dynamics. Yeah. Um, um, more, go ahead. Just if they have the same solutions, if they have the same set of solutions. That's one. That's one. That's one approach. That's one approach. Um, but that 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 gives rise to 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 I mean, what, what you just said there gives rise to one of the most interesting aspects of by simulation. So the the general question is for for any two systems which which we can view as as having some kind of agency or reactivity or or you know change state. We can ask whether or not. Um, whether or not the two systems are somehow the same. Um, and um, by simulation, 
uh, says, well, you know, um, let's call the first system P and the second system Q. So if, if um, there's some action by which P goes from P to P prime, um, then there has to be a Q prime such that Q goes by the same action to Q prime. And P prime and Q prime are bisimilar. So it's a recursive relationship. So P and Q are bisimilar if, if uh, that holds and vice versa. So it's got to also be the case, uh, not just that uh, Q simulates P, but that um, P simulates Q. So it's a, it's a bi-simulation. Yeah, so that recursive definition took me some time to get used to. But is it, I mean, essentially it's, it's just ensuring the fact that P prime and Q prime are going to be able to match each other's moves as well, right? Yeah, that's exactly it. They, they, they always you know, do that. Yeah, it's, it's like uh, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. They're always matching each other's moves. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's, uh, that, that, that's uh, the, the bi-simulation view of equivalence. It's a kind of system equivalence. Mm -hmm. But what you just talked about was a sort of solutions equivalence. Um, and it's really interesting to compare different notions of equivalence. Um, uh, at, the, at the outset of computing, um, people were looking at, you know, sort of sets of, of results. So when you, when you look at a, a language generated by a regular grammar, you could compare the sets of words generated by the grammars. Um, and it turns out that the complexity of that question, you know, so if, you know, I have grammar A and grammar B, and I just look at the sets generated by those words, by those grammars, um, then the question is whether or not the sets are the same. And that turns out to have an enormous complexity. It's P space complete, right? So oh. super, super high complexity. Now, intriguingly, if instead of comparing the sets, you were to compare the automata that um, corresponded to the grammars, right? So the automata mm -hmm. that would generate those sets. Um, that's a bi-simulation problem, right? You can, you, can, you can think of the, you know, the automata in a given state as a, as a you know, like P and, and Q, and you can think of taking a particular transition in that automata as an action uh, moving to a new state, which is the new state of the automata. So that, that, um, that particular variation of the equivalence problem. So instead of looking at the sets of words, you look at the automata. That has a uh, complexity polynomial. Great. Yeah. So that's an enormous reduction yeah. in <laughs> complexity. <laughs> yeah, that's now, a great example. <laughs> so an, an, another, uh, another um, we, can, we can go further, um, which is uh, if we look at, um, and, and instead of regular languages, we climb up the language hierarchy and we go from regular to context free. Um, so we're, we're still not at Turing complete, right? These are, these are still just context-free languages. Um, so the language equivalence problem is not decidable. You can't do it. The context course free. for context-free languages yeah. is a well-known result. Um, but what, uh, what, but intriguingly, if you consider the by simulation problem, it's polynomial. <laughs> really? Yes. <laughs> and, thank, and in fact, if memory serves, I might be wrong about this, but if memory serves, it's bounded above by a quintic polynomial. So it's, 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 you know, it's not going to be the fastest ever um, uh, to, to, to find all cases, but it's, uh, it's still, you know, like it's not even exponential. It's wow. definitely doable, right? So you go from can't do it to can do it in polynomial time. Yeah. That's okay. amazing. <laughs> so that, that says that there's something magic about the behavioral view, the intentional view yeah. that it is not present in the sort of, you know, the extensional or dare I say, denotational view, Yeah, uh, which is why um, by simulation seems to be so important. And we can kind of liken um, the, um, the extensional view to the solutions view that you were um, looking at. Um, yeah. So the, que the question is, is there a notion of bi-simulation that works for differential equations? And people have actually looked mm -hmm. at 
um, by simulation for probabilistic and continuous systems. So that's an open research area, but it's a it's an interesting one. Um, and so it's so when we think about it as a as a, and the other thing is that it's an effective notion of equality, right? We can we can dis describe it as a procedure, um, and uh, it lines up. Um, very nicely with the scientific method in the sense that we can talk about two systems as being the same if we can't find a distinguishing experiment. So, so when, you, when you say uh, describe it as a procedure, what do you mean exactly? Procedure to test that, that these two things are bisimilar. Exactly. But like what What's an so example the of that procedure? So, so the, the procedure, now, now, now this is the brute force way and there are a lot of better algorithms than this. And, and yep. if you look up algorithms for bisimulation, there's a rich, rich literature on that. Yep. Um, but in general, you just simply, it, um, you ask for an enumeration of all the actions um, mm -hmm. that are possible from a particular state. Uh, and then you just go and check recursively, you just walk the graph recursively. Okay. Yeah. How is that not, ex oh, okay, so this this would be a, one that's probably exponential, but there are ones that. Oh, the, the complexity, the complexity of that, that's ultimately undecidable, right? If you have Turing complete, oh. right? Oh, okay. um, it, it's effective, but it may not return a result. I see. And when you when you restrict it to particular classes of graphs or automata, then the complexity um, um, becomes tamer. I see. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, one of the interesting things is that um, this idea has been discovered multiple times. Um, so uh, Davide San Giorgi has a paper like a, on the bisimulation proof method in which he, he talks about the fact that it's been discovered and forgotten and discovered and forgotten. Um, and it wasn't until uh, David Park um, sort of discovered it again that Milner recognized the significance of it and it kind of stuck. It took hold, with, at least within the concurrency uh, community. Um, uh, another interesting fact about bisimulation is that all forms of equivalence. So there's a nice result from around 2005 that, that shows that all of the proposed forms of equivalence in the, uh, for computation um, factor through by simulation in the sense that they're, they're um, all a form of by simulation with, um, with filtering. Um, so that's in particularly nice. Uh, when it you says say this, all forms of equivalence, what what kind of or so you can what, what kind of so you can you can look at trace equivalents um, you can look at failures equivalents you can look at oh, what, ready equivalents or so-called two-thirds by simulation those kind of. so all of those proposed notions of equivalence can be can be presented as um, factoring through by simulation so it's by simulation plus some filtering so you can like for each kind of equivalence you can construct a graph that corresponds whose by simulation corresponds yeah, so, to it. So by, by simulation plus some, um, some you know, way of collapsing things, mm -hmm. but, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah th that's, that's the idea. Cool. Um, yeah, yeah, I should um, bring up those results again. It's a very lovely paper. Uh, so that's, um, so that, that, what that says is that, you know, it's not just that the complexity is nice or that, you know, it's, um, or that its conceptualization is nice, or that it lines up with science is nice, but also that it somehow seems to be very, very fundamental. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, one of the things that's really interesting and, and is related to uh, uh, this research program that Christian and Mike and I have been looking at, um, which, we've, which we've officially redubbed operational semantics and logical forms. We were ca calling it Ladle, um, because it had focused on the distributive law as the primary means of realizing models, but um, Christian has found a, um, a different approach um, to solve the problem that doesn't depend upon a distributive law. So we're dubbing the research program operational semantics and logical form. And that, um, that has a, uh, 
uh, a reference to um, uh, this program is, is really a, uh, a progenitor or, or descendant of um, uh, yeah, descendant of uh, uh, Abramsky's uh, uh, denotational semantics and logical form, or domain theory and logical forms, mm -hmm. is the the and essentially, you know, given given a domain theoretic account, he can generate a logic, and that logic has um, nice properties relative to the um, uh, domain theoretic <laughs> presentation of the notion of computation. Mm -hmm. um, so, so here, you know, what we're saying is that. Um, uh, the denotational account or the domain theoretic account is nice, but the operational um, account is is more pragmatic. And so the question is, can we can we treat that out the, those intuitions? Can we expand those intuitions uh, in much the same way that Curry Howard can can be expanded um, not to not just be about the simply type lambda calculus and uh, intuitionistic logic, but to a, a much wider field. So we're, we're doing the same thing. Um, and uh, so, so, so in particular, the expansion of uh, um, the Curry Howard, uh, you know, um, Abramsky observed that, you know, we should probably be able to do the same for concurrency. Um, and that, uh, that then ropes in logics like the Hennessy Milner logic. Milner and Matthew Hennessy observed that the, the sort of possible world semantics could apply to um, to the transitions of a process algebra. Uh, and then the polyadic pi calculus tutorial, uh, Robin uh, presents a, a variant of Hennessy Milner logic mm -hmm. um, that corresponds, you know, provides a logic for terms in the pi calculus. Um, and one of the, the nice results in that paper is that logical equivalence corresponds to by simulation. Yeah. Um, so we get um, that uh, two programs are by similar if and only if they satisfy exactly the same set of um, And then along comes Kyrace. Uh, Luis Cairo's um, with his spatial logics and spatial logics have a kind of x-ray vision um, in the sense that they can see when a process is uh, a parallel composition and they can see when a process has um, the structure of declaring a name to be um, bound, you know, um, bound by a new scope. Mm -hmm. So those two things are things that um, Hennessy Milner logic can't see. Um, and it's really important to understand that if you look at the, um, the pi calculus and you look at the um, semantics, it's effectively an interleaving semantics um, in the sense that the com rule only applies to one um, communication at a time. Uh, so if you have, you know, a big parallel composition that has lots and lots of potential uh, um, communication events uh, that could all happen in parallel, the com rule as originally stated would only allow one of them and then another, but the order would not be specified. So um, there's a theorem for the pi calculus that every, every process can be represented as a big sum of um, interleavings. Yeah, that's um, weird to me. I, I hadn't really appreciated that until recently, and it's uh, it it definitely makes sense, but it's just like a surprising, very different way of uh, thinking about the process or writing it down. Yeah, yeah, that, that that I I agree with you. Well, but basically, what it, the the content of the theorem is that the the you know um, calculi that have this kind of com rule are not truly concurrent. They're only non-deterministic, hmm. right? So you, you, don't, you don't know the evaluation order, but you know that there's some evaluation. And what is, um, uh, what would be something that's truly concurrent? So, so people have looked, looked at uh, so-called so true concurrency and then provided systems to give, you know, um, multiple calm events all at once. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, so the, this whole um, true concurrency semantics um, approach. Uh, 
Um, and, and one of the interesting things about the work that Mike and I have done is, um, uh, and that we've roped Christian into is, is this idea of an evaluation context. Um, and with an evaluation context, you can straddle the spectrum between the interleaving and true concurrency, yeah. um, which is exactly what happens on machines, right? So on machines, you only have some finite, well, if I'm talking about classical computing machines. I'm not talking about quantum machines. Um, but on, on, on classical computing machines, like we you know, might find you know, inside a, a, a Mac Pro or an iPhone or an Android phone or you know, some Intel device, um, uh, the, um, the, you have some physical number of threads, some, and then you map the logical number of threads down to those physical threads. Um, so you can have you know, some limited form of true concurrency. So you might, your, your par might have, you know, a hundred different com events that could all go at once, yeah. but you've only got eight actual physical threads. And yeah. so you'll, 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 you'll reduce those in chunks of eight. <laughs> yeah, that's weird. Yeah. Yeah. But now that um, we're like, now that we've been digging into theories with free writing and putting the graph straight into the theory, we we can't do that if we want to allow the parallel rewrites. Exactly. Exactly. So we can we can allow the parallel rewrites, but but also with the evaluation context, we can we can model real world situations where you know you, you actually only have a certain amount of concurrency. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you, you spend that all down and then you have to have an, another supply. <laughs> um, so you can, you can, you can, with the evaluation context, we've now model that kind of thing and, and that's nice. And, and then there's a virtualization of that, which is, you know, something like the, the blockchain idea of gas or flow. Um, so, so, uh, so go ahead. Does this true concurrency make by simulation more complex than in the interleaving just the interleaving pi calculus yeah so 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 it's the same idea right you don't have to uh, adjust the definition it, it mm -hmm. still works but you um but now uh your logic is going to have to be able to see this somehow see yeah. the true concurrency and this is this is now now this is the connection to the spatial um, logics is they can they can see when a process is a parallel composition. So instead of a well, it seems like one way to handle it is that instead of a single action, a process can now take a multi set of actions at once. Yes. Right. That's a, that's one approach and that, that has been explored. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. But we're not going that way. We're, we're going. Well, uh, we're, we, we want to be agnostic. We want to <laughs> work at a level above that if at all possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but, but, but the, I guess the, the point I'm trying to make is that it would appear that something breaks as soon as you can make these kinds of observations. So, so no longer, uh, so spatial logic is more discriminating um, in terms of behavior than the bi-simulation that, that gives rise to the interleaving yeah. theorem, right? Um, and what you can do to recover that, uh, and this is what Loses and Kairos show is you add actions that correspond to the um, e the equivalence of um, uh, on on the park um, term constructor. So there are there are a, a couple of equations um, that are associated with par. Actually, there are, there are three. So one is that p par zero is p. Another is that p par q is the same as q par p. And the third is that p par q par r is the same as p par q par r. So it's associative. Mm -hmm. um, and the latter two equations um, 
uh, can be treated as if there are actions associated with commutation and actions associated with reassociating um, process, reassociating terms. Um, and once you, this is very, very akin to the category theoretic view, um, where you've got morphisms that would correspond to the symmetry and morphisms that would correspond to dissociativity. Um, and by the way, just as an aside, you know, since categories are kind of like graphs, um, you know, you can, you can use by simulation to think about graph equivalence, and you could use by simulation to think about a notion, notions of equivalence in category theory. Yeah. Um, so, so those, so, so it, it has lots and lots of applicability. And in fact, in general, one of the things I think is going to be important, um, is to transport by simulation over into mainstream and classical mathematics. Um, because I, I think it, it's an incredibly powerful proof technique as well as, you know, this powerful notion of equivalence. Yeah. Um, uh, and we haven't talked about by simulation up to. Um, uh, but but uh, one of the most interesting things in the history of, of by simulation as it relates to the pi calculus and, and concurrency theory is um, oh, sorry, before I go down that path, let me just fin tie off this, this, this other thread. Mm -hmm. um, so so uh, the general notion is when, and, and this is what we, we, we hope to be able to prove with the operational semantics and logical form is that um, uh, you, we, we want to be able to show that uh, when we introduce the structural connectives, and these might not be par, right? It, you know, it might be application in the sense of lambda, or it might be the, uh, uh, you know, the formation of an ambient uh, in the ambient calculus, or or any number of, of other possible um, uh, term calculi. We wanna we wanna show that um, when, even though we can see this structural stuff, and the logic is strictly more powerful than by simulation if the by simulation is unaware of the structural capabilities, we can always sort of add morphisms that allow us to see the structure, yeah. probe the structure, and then and thereby recover this relationship between logical equivalence and by simulation. Mm -hmm. um, so, so this is, you know, another way of putting that is that data is programmed that all data structures can be turned into to programmatic actions, um, which is the essence of, you know, the inside of the Lambda calculus and church numerals and those kinds of things. And is the essence of, of um, the pi calculus that, you know, r rather than, than thinking about what things are, the data centric view, we think about what things do, uh, the programmatic or control flow centric view. Um, and so this, this ability to turn you know, um, the structural um, uh, predicates back into behavioral things is really just making sure that you have enough um, um, actions recorded, behavior recorded that corresponds to the structure. So that's how the, the two are related. And, the, and to do this, you can just replace all of the equations with rewrites? Um, that's the idea? Yeah, they, well, you, you replace them with the, the corresponding bi-directional rewrites. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, There's so, so much to talk about in these conversations. I mean, one of, one of the things that I think is, is, is uh, also uh, really important to explore, and I just haven't had the time to explore it, is, um, uh, but I, I talked about this on the Casper standoff, is um, essentially the difference between classical mathematics and computing uh, the, the structures that classical mathematics structure uh, studies um, and that the computing structures is the refactoring of behavior so whether you're talking about a monoid or a group or a ring or you know a field or a vector space or you know um, a module or what, whatever whatever structure you're talking about the structures effectively just sit there they don't they don't have behavior on their own 
the behaviors and the morphisms between the structures. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and category theory is largely informed by that view. So category theory is all about finding the notion of structure to preserve by morphisms. That was, that was the set of intuitions that was informing the development of category theory. Mm -hmm. um, but, but computing takes a completely different view it says, no, no, the behavior is the fundamental thing, right? When we compute, we're doing something. Yeah. Um, and so it, it puts the behavior, it takes the behavior out of the morphisms and moves it over in and ties it up with the structure. So, you, so in general, a notion of computing it, from an operational semantics point of view is given when you have a, you know, some kind of grammar that generates the terms. Uh, some kind of equivalence on, that erases syntactic differences that don't make a difference, and then a uh, set of rewrite rules. Now, the, the equations that erase the syntactic structure that does, doesn't make a difference, so P par Q is the same as Q par P is an example. Um, so those equations are bidirectional, right? They, they run, you can think of them as two, uh, a rewrite from one from left to right and, and another rewrite from right to left. But the rewrite semantics are unidirectional, typically speaking. Yeah. So the COM rule goes one way, and that's because you could have lots of different COM interactions that result in the same you know, um, continuation. Um, and the same with application and Lambda and lots and lots of other examples of this. Um, and, and, and so you, you forget where you came from. Uh, and that forgetfulness is directly related. So I'm going to put put forward an, a, an idea, a hypothesis, a proposal that this this for classical computing systems, you're going if, if your system is 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 classical, then not reversible like lambda or high, that this corresponds to the thermodynamic consequences of computing. And essentially, all I'm doing is following Bennett's work, where where um, where he he analyzes the Maxwell's demon problem. You know, so you've got a you've got a, a, a chamber um, with a, with a divider down the middle, and you've got some distribution of high energy and low energy particles bouncing around in both halves. And there's a little hole, and uh, and a, a demon has is controlling a flap letting high energy particles go to one side and low energy particles go to the other side. So over time, the system decreases in entropy. And so the question is, how does this, how does this avoid violating the second law of thermodynamics? Mm -hmm. And in particular, you know, so like we could say, well, you, you, you've, you've invoked a demon, so all bets are off in terms of, you know, the physical, you know, in terms of its relation to physics. So then you say, well, how about if we replace the demon with a computer? And now the computer is measuring the energy of the particle as it, as it uh, approaches. Um, and, uh, and, you know, do, does, the, does the, the, the job of the demon in terms of sorting the particles. Um, and what, what Bennett showed was that the, um, the, the computer eventually has to reset. It has to go back to you know, a particular state where it doesn't remember all this, all the information about each particle. And that resetting is the thermodynamic consequence. And in particular, the, the forgetful act is the one that has thermodynamic consequences. Um, and so that's where all the entropy is going, is in forget, you know, erasing the state of the computer. And so I argue that that's, that's the same in each of these classical accounts of computing. The one directional rewrite rules are the things that generate the thermodynamic consequences of the system. Mm -hmm. um, so ap apologies for, the, for that aside, but I think it's a, a really worthwhile yeah. and in interesting aside. Yeah. Um, Okay, so 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 what we've done is we've we've covered this idea of um, uh, how the the structural connectives can you know we can we can beef up the system in terms of additional um, additional actions that correspond to the equations on the structure, and that gives us um, our ability to recover that by simulation you know is the same as logical equivalent.
And this doesn't really um, affect, it doesn't make computing with the language any more intensive because computers already treat equations as bi-directional rewrites. Is that? Uh, uh, oh, it's, no, that's a really important point, actually. Um, so, so the complexity of checking the par um, structural connective and spatial logic is exponential. It's, it's very high hmm. because you have to look at all pairs. There's just no way around it. Um, so it gets, it gets really bad. <laughs> um, but, but the nice thing is you, you, you with the, with the structural connectives, you, you've gone from, you know, being able to, there, there were things that you couldn't say or see before, right? You couldn't see the number of threads. But now with the structure, with the par connective in spatial logic, you can see the number of threads. Mm -hmm. in, uh, and, 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 and we, we should expect this, right? You know, like there's this deep connection between the number of threads and primality. And we know that checking primality has lots of interesting complexity. <laughs> yeah. um, so we, sh we should be expecting this. Um, but, uh, but the, 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 um, uh, the, the point I want to make is that now the, the, another aspect of the history of bisimulation is, um, when we talk about these actions, taking one state to another, um, you know, essentially we have some kind of label for the action. Um, but when you talk about reduction semantics, so like beta reduction for the lambda calculus or com reduction for the pi calculus, um, figuring out the notion of the label has been more complicated. Um, so Milner originally gave a label transition system for the semantic, Milner and Perro. Milner, Perro, and Walker gave, gave an LTS for, for the first presentation of the pi calculus. And then, Milner says, well, I'm really trying to make something that's a lot more like Lambda. So I want a notion of reduction. So he, 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 he uh, comes up with the reduction semantics for the pi calculus. And then, you know, in doing so, he loses the, the LTS. He loses a direct connection to the LTS semantics. And so he doesn't have a good notion of bisimulation because the COM events are all supposed to be invisible. Uh, and so he and San Giorgi work out this notion of barbs. And in parallel, Milner, Sewell, and Leifer work out a way of deriving labels from contexts. Um, and so those have been two ways of, of trying to recover a notion of, of um, bisimulation that corresponds to reduction in the sense that bisimulation becomes a congruence. Um, and the idea of congruence for, for those people who are not familiar with this is it's, it's essentially like canceling. You want to be able to say that if P par Q um, is similar to R par Q, then P is by similar to R. You just cancel out the Q. And you want to be able to cancel contexts more generally, not just par, but, but more general contexts. And, so this, then, so you can do equational reasoning. You can calculate like you you would do arithmetic, right? With all the cancellation laws and all of that. Um, so that that's why you want by simulation to be a congruence um, with respect to reduction. Um, and uh, and so so that was that was uh, um, an important line of research, but what got left behind was the barbed by simulation. Uh, and so um, barbed by simulation was, was, a, was another way of, re of recovering by simulation. Um, so essentially you, you say that all the reductions have to match, but, but you also have to um, make sure that you have the same set of observables and these observables were the barbs and essentially the barbs were, were actions that a process could, could take. Mm -hmm. And so what Christian and Mike and I have looked at is, um, uh, is using context as barbs 
And uh, do, do you want to say a little bit about that? I feel like I've been talking way too much. Uh, sure. Um, yeah, so the labels, um, if you're thinking of them as potential actions that a process can make, uh, the idea that you could also think about it in terms of context is saying if the process were put into this context, then it could evolve to the following process. And the two perspectives are kind of interchangeable. And um, in terms of this idea of being agnostic and trying to write these general theories with rewriting, um, we can't depend too much on how Milner and others did it for the pi calculus. And this idea of doing it contextually seems to be more general. And yeah. yeah, so you can just take your presentation of the theory, look at all of the rewrites, and basically in the source of each rewrite, you're basically looking for ways to poke holes in it and those are going to be your labels. And then you basically take your original reduction graph and um, you're basically um, poking holes in the sources of the reductions. And you're probing those processes to, to line up with those context labels uh, so that you can give a label a transition system with more information. Yeah, so, so, so what, what, what we offer, what we, what we offer a variant of the notion of barbed by simulation um, in the sense that we, again, we're going to insist that whatever reductions you could make, in other words, whatever rewrites you could make, P and Q have to enjoy the same rewrites. Um, but then also, if you could place P in a, context and we would call it a prime context so that it's not like a big fancy sprawling context with lots and lots of terms but really just matches the left hand side of a, of a rewrite um, if you could place p inside that and there is a there is a rewrite um, then that context uh, is a barb it, it constitutes an observable or an experiment uh, and so then you have to be able to place P in the same context and get a corresponding uh, rewrite. Um, yeah. So, uh, so, so that, that, that idea is basically just lifting the notion of barbed by simulation. Um, and so the, the aim now is to prove that this notion of the barbed by simulation together with the, uh, um, the substitution machinery that comes from the um, second order algebraic theories will allow us to prove that um, um, barbed by simulation is a congruence yes. and that the logics that we generate, if you add in the actions that correspond to the, the structural equivalences, the, the observations, of course, that 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 um, notion, that enriched notion of bisimulation with these extra actions um, will be um, uh, exactly equivalent to the logical equivalence that we get. Yeah. So those are, those are our, our two proof obligations. And then, and, and what that does is it's very practical, right? It, it allows us to, to, instead of, you know, having, instead of talking about the Liskov substitute substitutability principle we give mechanism for substitutability in the sense that we know that if you put a uh, if you put a um you know a, a p by similar to q in you know you know p replaces q in some context then that's going to be safe as long as p is by similar or as long as p meets um uh the logical spec that is demanded Right. So, so it gives us a, you know, a rationale and a basis for talking about substitution, yeah. you know, of components. Yeah. Not, not, not just of, you know, values for arguments. What, what, what's an example when you want to treat, I get that in theory, 
if two processes are bisimilar, then you can treat them as interchangeable. But when do you actually want to do this substitution in practice? Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, I mean, basically now what we're talking about is making, you know, software behave like hardware, right? Is it, we, we know what it's like for a, a component on a motherboard to fail. Right. And, you know, we want to pull out that component and plug in another one, right? That's substitutability. So okay. that's, that, that's what we're talking about is, is being able to do that at the software level. And that has been sort of the goal of, you know, systems like object oriented programming and all kinds of other things. Because, you know, I mean, the, the, the idea of software reusability ultimately comes down to this pluggability. Right. But, but without all of this uh, reasoning, <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> we, we, we've seen that so software, sub software reusability has been fraught, you know, yeah. Um, you know, when it's when it's gov governed by these uh, governed by the, the object oriented principles that it wasn't an supportive enough of a framework to make the reusability have the same kind of utility that we thought it would. Yeah. Um, cool. So I think this is a, oh, I mean, we, we, we covered what I wanted to cover uh, in terms of, you know, the history, the relevant um, connections and, and how it lines up with the research that we're doing. Um, the only other thing is that um, this then also becomes the basis for the notion of query. Uh, uh, so um, uh, one, once we once once we have all these assurances that um, the logic does, um, you know. It, coincides with by simulation, then we have the right to use it as a query language. So we can, we can take terms and poke holes in them and, and say, well, in this hole, in, I, I'm putting a, a, a formula which governs the kinds of things that could go into that and that go into that hole. Um, and now you get, now you get a, a query language that can be applied to uh, GitHub or, um, you know, um, the smart contracts that are up on the blockchain or yeah. uh, a, a wide range of other things. Yeah. But it's good stuff. Uh, I, I, <laughs> it is, it is, but it's, it's also, you know, it's one of these things where the, 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 uh, the, the research program is relatively, you know, like we, we covered most of the salient points in an hour. Um, but nailing down all the details of the research has taken decades. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's getting there. Yeah, one step at a time. Well, thank you so much, Christian. I really appreciate you taking um, um, uh, uh, you, you, you taking taking the time. I know you're, you're you've got a busy schedule and you've got a thesis to write, um, but I, I really appreciate these conversations. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. Uh, talk to everyone soon. All right. Sounds good.